يعني السلام عليكم لازم نتعلموا هذه على لا يجوز
with the Think Tank Science Museum in Birmingham. That's my home city's science and industry museum, where we have the oldest working engine in the world, made by Matthew Bolton and James Watt. And we have the third oldest working engine in the world. The second oldest engine is Skaters in Australia, but we have numbers one and three. And we have the oldest electrical machine, which is a generator that was used for silver plating. It was the very first commercial use of electricity access. And a museum with a very interesting collection. And I'm Wikipedian in residence with Orchid. And later on, I will tell you what Orchid is. It's a little bit different to the usual glands. So that's me. You saw this text on a slide this morning already. You all know this message, don't you? Everybody? Yes? Good. This is what we tell museums, what we tell glands, we do. And we say to them, that is what they're supposed to be doing. And we can work together. We can collaborate. And when they understand that, then they start to collaborate on having a Wikipedia in residence, having an editathon, donating images, and all the other things that we want to talk to them about. So that is the <coughs> most important message you can give to galleries and libraries and archives and museums. <coughs> You all know the phrase glam. If you're not sure, I've already said it a few times. Galleries, libraries, archives, and museums. And we take that very broadly. This, by the way, is a stately home in Staffordshire, which is the English county just north of where I live. And part of that home is a county museum, a local history museum, where I was with Peter in residence two years ago. I wasn't in that beautiful building. I was in the stables at the back where horses used to live, which is much more appropriate. But it's, it's a gallery and an archive and a museum. So it's three of the four. But we also include in GLAM other things. Zoos. Zoos are, zoos are uh, museums of animals, if you want to take a, a very literal view. Botanic gardens a library of plants. They can be a, a herbarium of dried pest plants or specimens that are frozen, or they can be where the plants grow in the ground, but they're still archiving those plants for future generations. <coughs> Learning societies. I've mentioned the Royal Society of Chemistry. I'm sure you've heard of other bodies like the Royal Society of Astronomy and the Royal Society itself from the UK, and I'm sure that in some of your countries you have similar institutions. So the the organisation isn't an archive, it is not a library, but it has an archive, or it contains within its premises a library, but it also has a lot of knowledge in people's heads and in the journals it publishes that we want to share with people. And research institutions, universities and commercial scientific laboratories also have something to offer us within the GLAM umbrella, even if they're not literally G, L, A or M. So, so we take a very liberal view of who we will work with and the sorts of people that we want to talk to. If somebody has something in their possession, some collection of knowledge in whatever medium it's recorded in, we want to talk to them. So I could also include in that television and radio station archives, for instance. We talk to the BBC about having some of their old films, some of their audio views on the Each one of those in a minute. But alongside it, 
Uh, we have a newspaper article about the very first Wikipedia in residence. A friend of mine called Liam Wyatt, who's just over there in Italy at the moment. Unfortunately, he couldn't get here. But he went to the British Library in 2011. Yes, 2011. Uh, went to the British Museum, not the British Library. And he said, can I be your Wikipedia in residence? And they said, well, we don't know what that means, but yes, you can. <laughs> so very understanding. And he worked with them for, as a volunteer for a few weeks because he's from Australia and he came all the way to England, right around the globe, to do this because he couldn't find an Australian museum who would let him do it. And from there has come the whole glam movement and this idea of having Wikipedia in residence with different institutions. So I wanted to pay tribute to Liam as part of my presentation. So, four things. The first one is strategy. So, before we do any programs, before we start planning events and putting dates into diaries, before we start looking at budgets and catering arrangements and everything else, <coughs> excuse me, we talk about why. Why would we do it? We say to the institution, the things I said earlier, you know, we're here to share knowledge, so are you, so let's look at what we have in common. We look at what, what the institution will get out of it and what they won't get out of it. So the first thing they say is, this is great because we can write a Wikipedia article all about us and we can put in that it's half price entrance on Wednesdays and children getting free at the weekend. Say, no, 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 it's conflict of interest and we're not interested in your opening hours. So we have to tell them what they can't do. We talk about what we can do together, the sorts of things I'm going to explain in a minute, and we talk about the mutual benefits. So there's no point in saying to a client, you have to help us do this because we want it if the client has no interest and no benefit. But the benefit for them is around more people knowing what they do. More academics and students and families visiting the museum and looking at the collection, visiting the library or the archive and accessing the documents. That's where they derive the benefit. It's not from selling cakes in the cafe and getting more people to buy tickets or anything like that. And we talk about risks. What can go wrong? Because we should never pretend that if you have a Wikipedia in residence, everything will be sweetness and light, and everything will go well. We have to say, there will be problems. Some of your staff may make mistakes, and the Wikipedians will blame you, your institution. Uh, some members of the public will say, this is paid editing, you mustn't do it. We want to delete everything you've done. And you have to say, well, these are the problems that arise. I've experienced them personally in, uh, in England. Uh, we have to say, how will we mitigate those risks? How will we deal with them? What can we do to prepare in advance for when things might go wrong? And we reassure the institution that when things like that happen, it won't be a calamity. It won't be all over the newspapers that something terribly wrong. Because we can deal with it. We can, we can have conversations. We can have dispute resolution on Wikipedia. We can reassure the museum that their staff will be properly trained before we let them edit Wikipedia, or whatever it needs to, to, to happen in order that these problems are minimised. So we have strategic talks, and I talk to the institution management team before I go and do any of the rest. And I would recommend to you that you do the same if you're going to talk to, to your grounds in your countries. I should say, by the way, just as an aside, I'm telling you a way to do this. I'm not telling you the way. If you find a way that works better in your country, in your culture, or for you personally, that's fine. I'm just giving you the way I do it so that you can adapt it to your own needs. So, I've done the strategic talk. The management team are agreed this is a good idea. They agree to put some resource into it, whether it means they pay for a Wikipedia in residence salary, whether it means they provide funding for other parts of the program, or whether it simply means they say to their staff, this is legitimate, you can do it in work time, and we will allocate two days of your time to work on this. It's still a resource. The next thing I do is staff training. I teach the people at the institution, at the GLAM, to edit Wikipedia. And I do that for two reasons not just one. I do it because I want them to edit Wikipedia. I want them to go away and write Wikipedia articles because they are the experts. The oldest steam engine in the world in a museum in Birmingham is looked after by a museum curator who got his PhD by researching his history. He is the best person to write about that engine on Wikipedia. So I want him to do that. 
But the other reason why I want to train museum staff to edit Wikipedia is that when somebody says to them, oh, Wikipedia is unreliable and you can't trust it, we shouldn't let our students look at it, they can say to them, well, that's not true. I've done some editing on Wikipedia. I know about how references work and citations. I know how the community checks what everybody does. So by training people to edit Wikipedia, even if they never write another Wikipedia article, they become ambassadors for us, they become representatives of Wikipedia, and they can speak about how Wikipedia works. And sometimes, they deal with members of the public who are researching a subject. So in an archive or a library, somebody will go in and say, my grandfather used to work for this company, and I want to know more about it, can I look at the archives? And in the old days, the archivist would say, yes, here is the set of papers we have about that company. When you finish, please give them back to me. And now, when I've trained them, they say, yes, here is the set of archives about that paper. When you finish, please give them back to me. And then, please write a Wikipedia article about it. And here's a handout that tells you how to get started. So again, by training them to edit Wikipedia, even if they don't go away and write articles themselves, they become our ambassadors. And they're happy to do that, because they know that the wider community will benefit from the articles that are written. And I say to them, this is what I want you to do. I'm up front, you know, I want you to tell the people to edit Wikipedia article, even after I'm no longer your Wikipedia in residence. I'm not just doing this while I'm there, I'm preparing for the future after I've left the organisation. I also teach them about open licensing. Because quite often they don't know what it means. They don't know about Creative Commons, they don't know about share alike and attribution and all those other terms. Not only for the images that they take or that they upload, but in terms of using content. They don't know they can take an image off Commons and put it into a museum brochure or a museum guidebook or a poster or on their website. They don't know that they can take text from a Wikipedia article and put it into a handout for visitors. So I teach them about that as well. I teach them to upload images to Commons. Now, that varies. Sometimes they take pictures on their phone and they just upload them. Sometimes they've digitized a collection of hundreds or thousands of archive images and they're donating those. So I teach them how to do bulk uploads and individual uploads and how to do categories on commons and not to panic if somebody tries to delete one of their images and how to get help uh, and how to not upload something that will get deleted because although they took a picture, it's a picture of a copyright artwork and they can't upload that. So we have these conversations as part of the training. And the last thing I teach them is to talk to Wikipedians. Because we're a funny bunch of Wikipedians. We have set ways of doing things and we have our expectations. And we all, as somebody did today when I put on my Windows PC, we're rude about non-open software and non-open content. And I explain to the exam staff that they're going to meet these people and these people have a way of working and they're volunteers usually. And they, so they're doing things because they want to, not because they have to. And I tell them about how, not just to talk to Wikipedians, but how to work with Wikipedians to the best mutual advantage. So that's usually a conversation over a coffee rather than a training session in front of computers. But it's still an important part of the activity. And when you talk to GLAMS in your country, you need to tell them about your local Wikipedians. What are the Wikipedia customs? You might need to explain that people are more likely to edit in Arabic than in English or in French than in Arabic, or whatever the situation is for your local circumstances. You need to make sure that the institution understands that before 20 or 30 people from Wikipedia turn up for an editor file. The next thing I help them with is public engagement. So once all the staff think this is a really good idea, and all the management think this is a really good idea, I help them to meet members of the public. So we have an editor file. Do you all know what an editor file means? Yeah? Does anybody not know what an editor file is? No? Good, so I don't need to explain, maybe? Okay, this is where we get a lot of people together and we spend a day editing Wikipedia and we all help each other. And I explain this to the institution that we're going to do this and that they have to provide Wi-Fi because we can't have an editor file if we can't connect to the, lab, to the internet. That people will bring their own laptops and that we will plug them into the power supply because some institutes only, you can only plug a, a device into the power if we've tested it and it's approved. Okay. And so no, we can't do an editor file there because people have to bring their laptops. 
and plug them into the animal to work. Or sometimes there's a suite of computers we can use, but that's very rare. And I talk to them about the need to, to motivate people. These Wikipedians are coming to an editor farm to do some editing as volunteers. They think it's a good thing, but they're not being paid. You can't tell them what to do, you can only ask them. And the best way to get somebody to do something for you is to give them something. So you give them a backstage tour. You take them around the museum stores that aren't normally open to the public. Or you arrange for a curator to give them a lecture or a talk about something in the collection. And you give them food and drink. Because we're all happy to work when we give them a free meal, aren't we? <laughs> and if you hold an event at the Black Country Living Museum, near to where I live, you give them English fish and chips. <laughs> because they have an historic fish and chip shop that they rebuild at the museum. And they cook using coal rather than gas or electric. And they cook really good fish and chips. And at the end of the day, we always give the participants a feedback form that says, was this a good day or a bad day? Did you like the venue and so on? And on this day, we said, what was the best thing about the day? And everybody said fish and chips. <laughs> so that's a good, good tip. If you can get an event at an English fish and chip shop, you're doing well. I also talked to them about photography. I said, some of the people who are going to come to this editathon aren't going to write Wikipedia articles. They're coming because they like photography. And they want to photograph the things in your museum. So you have to allow that. You have to think about whether you already have a photography policy that allows that. Or you have to change your policy. Ideally forever, but certainly for the day. It's okay if the cloud says you can't use flash on this object because it's fragile textile or it's a drawing that's going to lose its colour. If you tell us you can't use flash on that, that's fine. But don't tell us you can't use flash on this railway engine that's made of steel because the, the flash isn't going to affect it. We ask them to get some objects out and put them on the table, on a nice cloth, so that people can photograph them with a nice clean background rather than a lot of clutter. Or we ask them to open glass cabinets and take the front off the cabinets so they can take pictures without reflections. And the curators get very nervous. They don't like this. But we tell them we've done it before it works. You don't do it with gold objects that might disappear. You don't do it with fragile objects and if you breathe on them too hard they'll break. But you do it with bits of engineering and stuff or things that are going to be robust enough that they won't get damaged. And if you want to curate to handle them and we'll just take the photographs, that's okay too. The other thing we do is we prepare. We prepare a list of articles that we think should be written at the event. So we don't have 30 Wikipedians who turn up and we show them around the museum and we say, now go and write something. We don't know what, just go and write something. We say to them, if you want to write something else, that's fine. But we think these 20 things or these 30 things that we have on the list on the blackboard or online, uh, these are the important things in this collection that don't have a Wikipedia article. Maybe it's an article about the object in the museum. Maybe it's an article about the person or the company who designed or made the object. Or maybe it's about the family of objects. So a couple of weeks ago, we did an editathon at Think Tank, and one of the objects was a leather flying cabinet from World War II that the pilots used to wear. Well, on its own, that's not very significant. It's just a helmet. But there was no article on Wikipedia about World War II flying helmets, about the early leather helmets. There was an article about the modern helmets that looked like you could ride a motorbike that are really hard, but not about the other ones. So, so you write an article about the family of things. We have this list of suggested articles for people who aren't sure what to write. And we ask the curators of the museum or the gallery to prepare some sources. So they get the documents that we can use as references and they photocopy them. And then on the desk when people arrive is a stack of photocopies. So they don't have to spend time finding things. They can get on with the editing. They're not handling fragile documents. They have a copy that can be thrown away if it gets damaged. And if they haven't finished writing the article at the end of the day, they take the copies home with them and they can work at home. And incidentally, one thing that often happens is that the people who go to these editathons make contact with the curators and they go back later and say, can I write some more? Can you find me some more information? Or they phone up or they email and they say, you are very helpful. Can, can I ask you some more questions? And because the curators have met these Wikipedia editors and have eaten fish and chips and drunk tea with them, there's a bond. They know who they are. They have an element of trust. 
And they know that this person isn't asking the question to be a nuisance, they're asking the question to help the gland by writing an article. And so they're more willing to collaborate and to spend some time finding things in archives. I mean, it's their job anyway, but sometimes you just have to give people a little bit more help to do their job. So that's the public engagement side. And I, I have the most fun doing that. It's hard work, and when we're running an editathon, I rarely write a Wikipedia article because I'm usually too busy helping everything, everyone else. Oh, I should tell you some more about that. Um, usually when we bring people in, some of them are Wikipedia editors, but some of them are new people to Wikipedia. So we say to the museum, do you have a mailing list? Can you write to everybody on the mailing list and invite them to come? So some of my time is spent teaching people how to get started or finding a Wikipedia who will work with a, a new person as a pair and then work on an article together. <coughs> So that's a good way to get new people involved. And related to the conversation we had this morning, it could be a good way to get women involved. You can target women's groups and a mailing list for women in the locality and say, why don't you come to this end of the farm? There will be some women Wikipedia readers who will help you. So it's not a threatening environment. I mentioned helping with image, helping image uploads. Uh, sometimes I do them for the institution. I say to them, you give me 500 images on a CD or a hard drive and you give me a spreadsheet with the metadata in and I will do the uploads as part of my work. And sometimes I say to them, I will teach you how to do it. And sometimes I say, the uploads are too complex, but I know someone on Commons who runs a bot who can do that for us. So in every case, you need to know what the best approach is. And I always tell them when they're uploading to the Commons, we want the highest resolution possible, please. The image isn't just going on Commons so it can illustrate a Wikipedia article, 75 pixels wide, but people want to download the image and reuse it, or they want to study it. And a good example of this, recently, we uploaded an image from Think Tank, which is a black and white photograph of a German Zeppelin airship in 1914 over my home city of Birmingham. And one of my friends in Germany is a military historian, so I said to him, you might not have seen this picture before. Perhaps you'll find it interesting. And he wrote, I said, that's very interesting. Can you get a higher resolution version? Because you've uploaded a low resolution version, and I can't read the identity number of the airship. And if I have the high resolution version, I can get the identity of the airship, I can tell you who was flying it, where it came from, where it went to, who built it, and all this other information. So now I will go back to the museum and say thank you very much for the low resolution copy that you gave us, but please can we have the high resolution copy for this reason? And it's the same with an artwork like this. If you have the high resolution version, you can see the brush strokes. You can see the artist's signature. So we always want the highest resolution possible. Sometimes they agree, sometimes they say no. We sell our images. You can have the low resolution, but you'll sell the high resolution. And I'm sure you're already familiar with that debate uh, and can deal with it. And I also tell them, if they're going to do the uploads, they have to use categories of metadata on Commons. It's no good them giving us 500 or 1,000 images if we don't know what they are, we don't know where they're taken, we don't know what the objects in the pictures are. So they have to provide that information as well. I would rather have 10 images with good metadata than 500 images with no metadata. And I think most people on the projects would agree with it. This image, by the way, is in the Rijks Museum in Amsterdam. I'm sure you've seen it. Yeah. Uh, it's known as the Yellow Milkmaid because she's a milkmaid uh, wearing yellow. And when they reopened the Rice Museum recently, so it was closed for many years for renovation, people would look at the postcards in the shop and say, the colour is wrong. The wall should be yellow, not white. I, I know because I've seen it on the internet. And this happened so many times that they went online and researched and they found lots of copies of this image where people had taken their mobile phone to the gallery and taken a bad picture. Or they would take, use their camera to take a picture of an old postcard or an old book. And so they released a very high resolution, colour corrected version of this image. And they went to the websites that had the bad images and said, please will you use this free version of a much better image. And they did, and people stopped complaining about the postcards because now when they see the image online, it looks proper. It looks has a white wall, as, as indeed, and I've seen the original as it looks in real life. 
They were so pleased with the effect that that had that the Rice Museum, one of the biggest and the best art galleries in the world, took the decision to release all of their images of their artworks as in the highest possible resolution, you know, 40, 50 megabyte tips under a free license, as open, under open license. And so when you go to your art galleries local to where you live, you can say to them, well, the Rice Museum did it. They lost money on selling images, they accepted that, but they decided that the educational value of these images was too important to keep them for people who pay. And so we hope other people will do the same. Sometimes my job title is Wikimedian in Residence, not Wikipedian in Residence. And that's important because I work with clients <coughs> to talk about Commons and Wikidata and Wikisource and Wikiquote and Wiktionary. Wikipedia is the key that gets you into the door with those people. But then you tell them about these things which they've never heard of before, and you tell them why each of these is important, relevant to their particular institution. Certainly Commons, if they're uploading images, and Wikidata, because we're now putting an entry on Wikidata for every artwork in the galleries, um, and certainly for every artist and people like that. So you're not doing a good job if you're not including all those things. I'm also very keen, I made some jokes at the beginning about not being able to speak Arabic or indeed any other language. I'm typically English monocot. Uh, but I'm very keen to work on projects which are international, on here, and multilingual. So I help people to translate articles. And I do that, again, for two reasons. Firstly, <coughs> as I was saying to some chemistry students recently, they're happy to read stuff in English. They're in Tunis in this country, but they're so used to reading English scientific literature and writing scientific papers in English that they edit the English Wikipedia. But if you have a school child that wants to learn, start to learn chemistry, or if you have a farmer in a rural part of the world who doesn't have access to a paper library and has been given a chemical and been told, spray this on your land, and the farmer thinks, is this good or bad? Should I pay for this or should I avoid it? They need that information in their own language, whether it's Arabic or French or whatever it might be in the country concerned. So it's very important that those articles are either written or translated from English into whichever uh, subject it might be. It doesn't matter if they're not translated, if they're written from scratch. But the target audience needs stuff in the local language. It doesn't need it in English a lot of the time. <coughs> we forget sometimes that everybody in this room, and most of you people are well educated and privileged relevant to people like that, people who work a farm and don't have electricity in their home and use the Wikipedia Zero on a mobile for life and death matters, to find out about the health of their child or about their farm or whatever it might be. So we need to put stuff into a language. The other reason why we translate stuff is because it's the interest to our culture. So when I did sort of work with the Hamburg Museum in Germany, one of the objects in the museum is a model ship. And the real ship that Modeler was made in Hamburg and worked as a cruise liner out of Hamburg for many years, but then was sold to the Soviet Union and used by the Communist Party to take the middle ranking officials of the Communist Party on free holidays. So there are lots of people in Russia who would be interested in that ship because when they were young they had a holiday on it, or their parents had a holiday on it, or maybe they worked on it. So I said to the Russian Wikipedians, We've written 50 articles in this museum. You can translate whatever you want, but this one is particularly relevant because it's about something that's happened in Russia. And the same as some of the other articles in other languages. So when you have articles that are written about a gland in your home country, look at the subjects and say, <coughs> is this particularly relevant to people in France? Is it particularly relevant to people in Germany or Mexico or wherever it is in the world? And what languages should it be translated into? And you start with those. You can translate the other ones later, but you start with ones that have particular local relevance. Also, we work with language teachers. I'm sure that those of you in the education project will be familiar with this. And we say to them, we're going to write all these articles. Why don't you get the people you're teaching to translate them instead of telling them to translate a passage out of the book? And the students then are more motivated because they know that what they translate will have in real life and be used by people instead of going into a filing cabinet or into a waste paper bin. And we ask people to translate into their first language. 
So we don't ask a French school child to translate something into English. We ask them to translate from English to French. Two reasons for that are, firstly, that way they learn more vocabulary and idiom. And secondly, they're more confident and they do a better job of it. So maybe, through your contacts with Lambs, you can also help your local colleges or migrant communities who are learning your language to translate things into their own language from your language. A few, but not everyone. This is relevant to the point of having articles in lots of languages. You all know what a QR code is, or at least square barcodes, if you scan with your mobile. QR Pedia is a project that some friends of mine developed where you scan the code with your mobile phone or your tablet and we detect which language it's using. When you buy a mobile phone like this and you turn it on, the very first screen asks you to choose a language. I chose English, maybe you chose French or Arabic. People in other parts of the world can choose German or Japanese or Russian or whatever it might be. Every time you use your phone to request a web page, you can click on the link or you type in a web address, your phone sends a two-letter code, E-F English, A-R Arabic, F-R French. It says, I'm using this language. And the web server at the other end usually ignores it because it only has content in one language. But a well-written website that has multilingual content can deliver different content depending on what that code says your phone is using. And we use that technique with a QRpedia server to say, ah, oh, you're speaking French, so here's the Wikipedia article we wanted in French. Oh, and you scanned it, you're using Arabic, so here's the Wikipedia article in Arabic. Now, most of the articles that we write here are not only in one language. But when you have an article on Monet, the painter, it's in 20 or 100 languages. Um, I happen to know that the article on the banana is in 180 languages, because people all around the world eat bananas. So we put these codes on objects in museums, or next to objects in museums, next to the paintings, uh, on historic buildings, uh, on uh, statues, and sometimes they link to an article about the object. So there is an article about uh, Constables for Hayway and Van Gogh's sunflowers. Or sometimes they link to an article about the artist, the Constable or Van Gogh or whatever it might be. And sometimes they link to an article about the subject. So this is a painting of Winston Churchill. So we link to the article on Winston Churchill. I'll show you some examples. This is a woman and her child looking at an article about geology in the museum in Derby in England. This is the first museum that ever used QRpedia. The code is only about that big. So for a few dinar, or perhaps for one dinar, you can print an A4 sheet of paper with 20 of those codes on. You cut them up and you stick them in place with them glue. Very, very cheap to implement. If you want to show off, you can make them big like this. This is my friend Laurie in America. Uh, and those codes are about a children's carousel, a historic carousel, in the museum where she works. And they put those big plaques where the people queue up to have a ride on the carousel. Because these people are standing in the queue, and they're very bored, and the children are getting a little bit anxious and noisy, like they sometimes do. So mom or dad take out their mobile phone, scan the code, and read the article to the children while they're waiting and they see that happening. So that's a good way to entertain people who have dead time in queue. This one is on a ceramic plaque on a building in Monmouth in Wales in the United Kingdom. Okay. Have you heard of Monmouth area? Good. We did a whole town. We taught everybody in the town to edit Wikipedia, and everybody who was interested. We got them to write lots of articles. We got our friends around the world to translate those articles. Maybe some of you helped with it, if so, thank you. And then we put these plaques on every historic building. We put codes in the windows of the shops. We put them in the, on the wall of the pub and in the library, in the library books. And the county council, the local government body, gave free Wi-Fi to the town. So if you go to this town today with your mobile phone, you use the free Wi-Fi, you effectively have a guide to the town in your pocket in Arabic, in French, in German, in Japanese. And there's no reason why you couldn't do that here or in Tunis or in any other city in this region.
I also wanted to talk about small museums whose collections uh, may or may not have national significance. In fact, I should say that no national global significance. I'm sorry, that's a little typo. Um, quite often, the only place that certain aspects of history are recorded is in a small local museum or a small local archive. And that's just as important as going to the Bardell Museum or the British Museum or the Smithsonian in America. Those small collections are vital to our mission to share knowledge. And I'll give you an example. This little drawing by a famous local artist in Birmingham is in an art gallery in their archive. It's not even on display. And it's a little pretty scene. It's a bit faint, so you might not be able to see it. But it's an English village 200 years ago. And the art gallery like that, because it's good art, it's very well drawn, and it's by an artist who was one of the founders of the art gallery. So they see that as, as a very nice picture, very nice art. But as a Wikipedian, we see it as history because it shows you what that village looked like before cameras. By the time people had invented cameras, some of those buildings had been demolished and a road had been put through the village. So it's a historic record of what the place looked like as well as being good art. And the point of that is that quite often, the curators in the museum or the archive or the library or the gallery don't understand that the objects that they look after tell stories other than the ones that they have them for. So they have relevance for other people, perhaps in other parts of the world, that aren't the reason why the gallery or the library has it. And as Wikipedia, we have to unlock that. And that's another reason for persuading a gallery or a library or a museum to collaborate with us. I'm a little bit over time, I'm sorry, but that's my last slide. Those are my contact details. I'm on LinkedIn, that's my Twitter name, my web address and my email address. Uh, and I'm happy to take questions if we have time, but if not, you can always find me this evening or tomorrow and we'll have a chat. And I do hope you'll come and talk to me about this because I've only been able to give you a little overview of what working with land is about. So, do we have time for questions? Yes, we do. Okay, does anybody have a question? It was so perfectly explained that you are all now experts. No? Yeah. Okay. Questions? Yeah. Hi. What are the speeds of the wind? Oh. <laughs> Does anybody know what the speeds of the wind is? Yeah. Yeah, but why, why, why are the on the wind? What does it mean? Okay. Has anybody heard of King's Boy? Dark yeah. Side of the Moon? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah, well, they did an album called Animals, which had a song called Pigs on the Wing on it, which is a little love song, and it's one of my favourites, so that's why Pigs on the Wing. But that has very little to do with glamours. Do we have any questions about glamours? <laughs> <laughs> yes. okay. um, do you have uh, any arguments to say that uh, there is an increase of visitors after the interpretation of the uh, Yes. If you didn't hear, the question is, do I have some evidence that there is an increase of visitors to museums after a program like this? Yes. Um, we have to be careful with that because, as I said at the beginning, the reason we don't want clients to become involved because they think this is a publicity exercise. But we have proper measured statistics that the visits to their websites increase, and that the views of their images increase, and that visitors to the museum increase. <coughs> One of the people who translated articles for the Darwin Museum project, where we had the first QR codes was from Hong Kong. And she very kindly translated some articles into Chinese and I think into some other languages. And about a year later, she turned up at the museum. She'd come to London for a conference and had come all the way from London to Derby. That's longer than from Tunis to Monastir. Just to see the thing that she'd written the article about, which was really nice. And we have people who've been to Monmouth, just because they saw the publicity of the, of the wiki village and, and saw all this going on. So yes, we, we have both anecdotal and measured evidence that, that this increases visitors. Any other questions? Sorry, uh, um, you said something uh, here at the beginning of the presentation about uh, the relational between the Wikipedia community and the use of uh, open source. Yeah, I, I was just sort of talking about the fact that some Wikipedians have very um, 
described it to you it's about open source, and they go to a museum and they say, you have to let us have all these images because we, we're the people and we, you know, we, they all, all these pictures are out of copyright. And that can be upsetting to the museum, it can be threatening to them, and it can be rude, frankly, but very ill mannered. So before I introduce a load of Wikipedians to a load of people in the museum, I try to prepare both sides and say, these are the people you're going to be meeting, this is what they think like, be prepared for these questions, have an answer ready, uh, and be prepared to listen to what they have to say, because they do have some very good ideas and some good points to make, so let's, let's be ready for that. I perhaps sort of overemphasize that, but that's part of what I do. Any more questions? Okay, well I think I'm done. Thank you very much for your attention.